Hi, I'm Joseph Berardo. At MagnaCare, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the health care issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by New Jersey Council of County Colleges, MagnaCare, Activists, in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge, New Jersey Natural Gas, proud to support education in our communities, Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, and by New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Promotional support provided by Commerce Magazine and by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. Hi, I'm Steve Arabato. As you know, if you watch us on a regular basis, we like to bring you uh, presidents of uh, institutions of higher learning, and this is uh, no exception. We bring a terrific president of uh, a great college, Dr. Joanne LaPerla Morales, president of Middlesex County College, joins us. Good to see you, doctor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. For those who do not know Middlesex, describe it. Well, Middlesex County College is one of the 19 county colleges in New Jersey. We're located in Edison, New Jersey. Our main campus is there, and we also have centers in New Brunswick and Perth Amboy. Is it not a fact that you're having your 50th, 50th, anniversary. 50th anniversary? We're very excited. Uh, New Jersey has two county colleges that are celebrating their 50th this year. Hold on, I know the other one. You know the other one. Because you just told me it's Ocean. <laughs> Ocean. <laughs> Ocean County College? Ocean County College and Middlesex County College were the first two in 1964. That's pretty great. So this year there's lots of celebrations. We have open houses, we have galas, we have time capsules that we're digging up. Uh, it's a big deal. Lots of history. But you also have a lot to look forward to. Um, let's talk about some of the initiatives, some of the programs um, that are going on at Middlesex County College. I, I mentioned animation gaming. Right. Now I want to be clear. There are courses in animation gaming, but there's not an entire program, is there? There will be an there entire program. Yes, we're putting through our first entire program in gaming and animation. And it's not just uh, computers. It takes in a lot of theater and writing, and uh, the students have lots of opportunities to do things. It's not just to create games on computers. That is fascinating. And we have a fascinating instructor. I'm sure he'd love to talk to anyone about the program. Look at you pitching already. I like that. <laughs> uh, talk about, ho is it hotel restaurant management? We have a department of hotel restaurant management and dietetics. And located in that department is something that everybody loves, culinary, pastry, and baking arts. And if you ever come to our campus, we'll let you judge the pie or the cheesecake contest. <laughs> OK, but let's talk a little bit about this. With all the reality shows. Mm -hmm around cooking, <laughs> baking, the whole bit, right? Do you see, or have you seen, more interest in this particular industry, in this field? <clears throat> there certainly is more of an interest, I think, in, in food in general, but also because New Jersey, that's one of the largest, hospitality is one of the largest employers in the state. So students have the opportunity to work not only in the food part and the culinary part, uh, but also in the management. So that's, that's something that we've been very strong on, the management You've aspect. also talked about Homeland Security. Talk about some of the initiatives there. Well, Homeland Security really comes out of our criminal justice department. And you'll see many programs started in criminal justice and have kept with the times in Homeland Security. We have actually a, an articulation program with uh, New Jersey City University that has a, a bachelor's degree in national security. Take a step back. People hear the okay. term articulation program and they think you're talking about speaking. Right, okay. I'm sure it's some sort of collaboration. It's a collaboration Describe between that. us and New Jersey City University, and they actually are offering bachelor's courses on our campus uh, for students who want to continue in Homeland Security, National Securities Administration. So that's interesting. Because community colleges are two-year institutions, right? Right, correct. You're talking about a four-year right. institution here at New Jersey City University, right? Right. More and more collaboration between two and four year universities and colleges? Absolutely. Well, New Jersey really is very advanced in this area because we actually have a state law 
called the Lambert Bill, which requires all four-year public institutions to accept the first two years associate degree into the four-year public institution. By law? By law. By law. That's a big deal. It is a big deal, and it has really helped the collaboration. We've always had good collaboration and cooperation, uh, but this is for students who complete their associate degree at the county college. They can go on to a four-year institution and have all those credits. Now, that's if they choose to. What about if someone comes in to Middlesex or any other county or community college and, and he or she says, I don't know if that's what I want to do. I right. would like to go to this two-year mm -hmm. school, this college, and I want to go to work. I want okay. to find a job. I want to find a career. Go ahead. Well, many county colleges, we all offer what we call career programs. For example, programs that only require two years. Nursing programs, there's some engineering technology programs, many programs in the health field, physical therapy, occupational therapy, respiratory therapy, rad tech. A lot of those programs are career programs that are intended for a two-year. So after your two years, you can work in the field. What happens in many of these fields mm -hmm. is students will start uh, with a good job initially and then go on to four-year institutions to imp to advance their careers. And clearly those, another category of folks who are not just looking to pursue their education but also looking to come back into the workforce are veterans. We talked about this before we got on the air. You have an initiative that focuses very much on the needs of veterans. Talk about it. Uh, we have a Center for Veteran Services that is funded by the Robert Wint Johnson Foundation. Uh, we began the center three years ago. We're into our fourth year. Mm. So veterans come back. What does back. it do for them? Uh, it provides veterans um, a way to enter the, the institution. Many veterans come back. Uh, they need advising or counseling or career um, opportunities for them. Uh, I've spoken to many veterans who have come back from uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, and they think navigating the college system is worse than what they've been through. Right. <laughs> so we try to <laughs> make it. That says a lot. Yes, and they also form support groups. We have veterans. Um, uh, clubs on campus. So the veterans really form um, a group that helps them, supports them in their work. Before I let you out of here, your background and how you found your way into this presidency. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I started out as a teacher. Uh, I was in the Peace Corps. That's how I started in education. Came back and did my graduate work at Columbia in higher ed administration and then just worked in a variety of jobs. Everything from uh, Dean of Continuing Education, uh, where I got my entrepreneurial skills, mm. uh, to Provost of an Academic Affairs. What do you love about County Community Colleges? Opportunity for students. Opportunity and access and the ability to have a good quality education at an affordable price. The first 50 years for Middlesex County College, give me the next 10. Uh, the next 10 are going to see some new and innovative programming for students, some, a lot of good support for sciences, the STEM programs. We're building a new building for biology and chemistry, and um, I think we'll see a lot more of our students going into the science areas, and that will be great for our students. On behalf of everyone in public broadcasting, congratulations on uh, 50 years. Have a terrific party. April 19th, Community Day. That's Community Day? Right, Community Day. At the Good college. stuff. Dr. Joanne LaPerla Morales, President, Middlesex County College. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Dr. Stephen Tannenbaum is a pediatric urologist at Holy Name Medical Center. Good to see you, doctor. Likewise. Um, the difference between a pediatric urologist and someone who's a urologist for big people? Um, completely different. Um, to be a board-certified, fellowship-trained pediatric urologist means that we did extra training mm. and we dedicate our practice to the care of children and children only. Children being defined as from day one of life till about 18 to 20 years of age. I have almost never taken care of an adult patient unless they have some sort of reconstructive mm. issue that's better dealt with by a pediatric urologist. That's the demographics, the difference. More importantly, 
the surgery that we do is completely different. For example? Pediatric urology, we basically fix things. We reconstruct, we repair. Adult urology most often is extirpative surgery. Extirpative. Where they're removing things. So if someone has a prostatic enlargement, the prostate is coming out some way. Uh, there's a kidney cancer, the kidney is coming out partially or in total. But in children, that doesn't happen. So in children, we're fixing things. We're fixing hernias. We're fixing an undescended testicle. Let's go through some of the most common um, issues that the young people face. And, and by the way, boys and girls. And girls. Let, let's do boys first. Sure. Do the, let's go through, you just started talking about it. So, First one is? Well, um, we deal with the urinary tract and the genital tract of both boys and girls. So obviously girls and boys both have urinary tracts and we deal with kidney issues and bladder issues in both boys and girls. Some of the common problems that affect boys and girls in the urinary tract would be an obstructed kidney. They're born with a congenital obstruction to a mm. kidney which requires surgical intervention to repair. Um, boys and girls can be born with urinary reflux, where urine refluxes from the bladder up to the kidneys. That can cause recurrent uh, urinary tract infections with high right. fevers. Because you've got to get it out of your body. Well, correct, but that can cause infection, and the child can get very sick, and then we have to fix the reflux. Various methods are available, um, including a procedure called deflux, or a more formal operation called ureteral reimplantation mm -hmm. surgery. That covers the urinary tract basically in boys and girls. There are obviously many other issues that can affect the urinary tract, but those are the two big ticket items. For, for parents, uh, you know, the, the notes on this program said that, that you and other professionals in your field are somewhat concerned that we as parents aren't talking enough to our kids about these issues, about their bodies. Right? Is that part of the issue? I think it's really important for parents to discuss body and physical issues with children. Um, firstly, just for the safety of the children regarding the unfortunate predators that exist out in society. Number one, what the do's and don'ts are of their private body parts. And in fact, I can tell you, Steve, that in the office, when I do examine a child, I always say that we can do this because mom is right next to us. Right. Or we can do this because dad is right next to us. Very clear this is off limits except in certain situations. Besides that, it's very important, especially for males, to examine their genitals because there's certain things that a male, especially an older child, you know, a teenager or a young adult, will detect on their own self-examination. What are they looking for? Well, one could be looking for hernias, varicoceles, testicular tumors. But how would someone know? Well, that's why it's so important for them to know what the baseline normal is. Right. And then if there's a concern, to present to the professional. That's for the older child. The younger child, the three, four-year-old, has no clue. That's where the parents come in. That's where the pediatricians come in. And that's where the specialists come in. Is it different for for girls? And if so, how? Um, again, within pediatric urology, it's not that, it's not that relevant for the female uh, child to really be that aware of their body because they get very few of the uh, anatomical issues that boys get. It's more for boys. More for boys because the genital tract is a little more complex in the boy than it the is. girl. Yes. And what's, I'm curious about this and having, we have uh, boys who are 10 and 12. Um, having an older boy who, who, who's gone through some things as well, but is part of the issue for, for boys, 10, 12, you know, 8, whatever, that they're uncomfortable with their bodies it, it, or that they don't, want, they don't want to talk about it? So if you start talking to a kid and a kid's like, Mom, I don't want to talk about that or Dad, I don't want to talk about that, is part of it that we have to get them comfortable? Agree 100%, Steve. You have to deal with every child at their appropriate level and the appropriate approach. Some children, you know, parents tell me some children run around naked around the house and the mother right. saw it right away, uh, even at a young age. And some children are more modest, even at a right. young age. 
So every child has to be addressed in their specific comfort level. And at the same time, the issue of, say, bedwetting, right, which can be traumatic on a lot of levels, right? Correct. Best ways for parents, best advice you can offer to parents right now? Uh, tricky. Or There's, is that individual? It has to be individualized to the family dynamic. There's a few different approaches to uh, nighttime bedwetting, including medications, including behavior modification with alarms, uh, various levels of success, but the approach has to, including doing nothing. Doing Some, nothing is an option. Sometimes the parents just want reassurance that there's no anatomical, no anatomical problems. And they say, oh, we're okay, we'll just sit tight for now. So it has to be tailored to the specific you know, family dynamic. Before I let you out here, when did you know this is what you wanted to do professionally? Uh, early on, during my uh, adult, during my general urology residency, I enjoy the pediatric population much more than the adult population. It makes so, a big difference. Uh, yes. Dr. Stephen Tannenbaum, pediatric urologist at Holy Name Medical Center. Thank you for joining us. Stay right there. Thank you, Steve. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Howard Dorman is a partner at uh, Weiser Mazars and a board of uh, directors member of the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Good to see you. Nice to see you, Steve. Thank you for having um, me. Describe your firm. My firm, we're a regional accounting firm providing tax, consulting, and advisory services. We're 26th largest in the country mm. with offices between Long Island and Philadelphia. We're about 100 people strong in New Jersey. And we have also affiliations in, seven, in 72 countries, mm. about the ninth largest international accounting firm. And for those who don't know what the Commerce Industry Association is, we have a partnership with them and collaborate with them on a lot of projects. Talk about that. It's a large chamber, and it's a great voice for businesses centrally located maybe in North New Jersey. Got a membership of about 800 to 900 members, and uh, we do great things in the community, mm. give back a lot. I'm fortunate enough to chair their annual golf outing, which we raise money for local charities. So, Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the fact that we're doing this program as we move into 2015, uh, uh, where this program um, for a good part of the year. The industries that you see, Howard, that are growing, that have energy and momentum in the state, what are they? There's a few, Steve. I see transportation and logistics as the port is slowly with the bridge, the Bayonne Bridge being raised and the Panama Canal opening up. I think we're, we're adding a lot of jobs into the port. From that, major distribution and manufacturing will come into the state. There's been a lot of relocation companies that have been consolidating facilities and moving into Bayonne mm -hmm. and Jersey City. Uh, there's probably 10 or 12 companies that I can mention that uh, have expanded to large facilities here. New Jersey's trying very hard to keep them here, without a doubt. How, it's interesting you talk about keeping you here. A lot of folks we've had in the business community have talked about New Jersey as a high tax state. Are we in fact? Absolutely. Talk about it probably now the 48th or 49th highest tax state between personal income tax, corporate income tax, and death and inheritance taxes. New Jersey's trying to make a change. I believe in legislature right now, there's uh, some uh, Talk about the estate. Legislature about the, the estate, estate death right. tax. By but the way, talk have... about that. Talk about that whole, there are two taxes now. So uh, explain that to folks, the estate tax versus the which one's the death tax? Well, death tax will be based on your estate. Go ahead. So the rates on that, New Jersey has another tax based on what's being inherited also by your heirs. So there's the estate tax and the inheritance tax. Runs about 15% combined. So put that together with 50% on the federal, and it's, it's a good reason for people to migrate out of the state. So, so talk about that as a competitive issue, Howard. Do most other states have both of those taxes when people die? No, I believe New Jersey's one of maybe three or four states really? that are left. Well, where did we ever start that in the, I mean, I'm not making a policy or political uh, uh, opinion or not expressing that at all, but I'm just curious, when did we ever start this and why? When the estate tax started maybe was the early 70s, revenue raising. Why, because we needed the money? Of course. 
But a lot, but 47 other states needed the money and didn't do it. So they raised it in other ways, whether it was some states don't have personal income tax. So how else are they funding But we have programs? a personal income tax as well. Absolutely. We have a sales tax as well. So we have a lot of those. Is we have too much government, whatever we're funding here. But I know New Jersey has it now in legislation to, to consider phase one out, of them. Phase out the estate tax, but it's not immediate. It's a phase out over yes, five over years. Yes, over time, because you need the revenue. Yes. I think is it five hundred million dollars uh, that they'd be talking about? Yes, it is. So understand, folks. You, you might say, well, that's ridiculous. Get rid of that tax. But if you get rid of that tax, you have a four or five hundred million dollar hole of that revenue that's expected to come into the state. And so if you get rid of the tax, you don't have the revenue. What are you going to replace it with or what are you going to cut? Correct. Those are real issues. Yes, they are. The business people you talk to, what is it that most of them want? Is it the cutting of personal income tax? Is it the estate tax? Is it property taxes or what? It's a combination of all the, they need to stay competitive. Their competitors could be they're importing or they could be located in in states like North Carolina where the overhead is lower, there might not be a union shop, it's a right to work, taxes are lower, so they can sell the product for a lower price. By the way, you use the term right to work. A lot of people don't know what that means. A right to work state, what does that mean? It's not union based. New Jersey's a strong union, a strong union state. Okay, someone would say, well that's a good thing, you'd say. I'm not saying it's good or bad. What is the impact on most businesses? What are most business people tell you? They would rather have a right to work, not to have the not to have a union shop. But I have clients that have union shops, and it's, control it's a controllable situation. Okay, so people could debate the Affordable Care Act to the end of time, right? But it's the law of the land. It's what it is. It's there. But what most people don't understand is the impact that many people in small business say, they say it has on them. What have you heard? I see the cost of health care going up. Our clients are finding ways to keep those costs down, which means it's more cost to the employee, even to the owner. You know, they're reducing, they're increasing their deductibles, in, increasing the out-of-pockets, using HSAs and FSAs. What to try. I mean? It's a health savings plan. It's, it's putting more control in your hands. So what's happening is you're getting a higher deductible plan, meaning you're out-of-pocket more, but so what we're doing is we're taking these, these additional costs, doing them before tax, so you save right. some money. So you're in control of your destiny, which is maybe what we need to do to control some of these out-of-control out of costs. What, what would you say to those who argue, well, you know, we want to provide health insurance for those 30-some-odd million Americans who didn't have it. This was the way to do it. And if it requires that we require business to, if they have more than... 50 employees. 50 employees. If it requires them to have health insurance for their people, their employees, well, that's just the way it is. That's how some people see it, you say. I say if those costs are manageable, trying to be so un unpolitical about it, if, as long as the costs are manageable and it's not causing price increases or me to make decisions about not giving health insurance sure. or certain other Because money's got to come from somewhere. Absolutely right. And so here's what's interesting. Say someone says, well, if you want that, we potentially might not hire more people. We might not expand, which doesn't help the economy, right? People said, no, no, I want you to do all those things. Can't I would argue that some of those people may not have ever run a business, right? Right, and you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's, you know, as a business person, you're employing X amount of people. You have a responsibility to not only your family, but to the 50, 60, or 500 employees that you have. It's not easy running that business. No, it's not. Got to balance no. all those issues in, in people's lives. Yeah. Now, Howard Dorman, you're doing it uh, every day for your uh, clients uh, at Weiser Mazars. Yes. And also a board member with the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey, and uh, they put out a great uh, what's the magazine called? Commerce. Commerce. Good stuff. We read it every month. We appreciate you coming in, Howard, and My uh, providing perspective. People could talk about these things all they want, but you see small business people every day trying to survive. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Good, Good stuff. Course. Thanks. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY.
Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by New Jersey Council of County Colleges, MagnaCare, Activists, in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge, New Jersey Natural Gas, Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Peter Rooney. In 2006, I lost my father to renal disease. He was on the waiting list for a new kidney, but did not receive one in time. Unfortunately, so many like my father have lost their lives while waiting for a life-saving organ. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and by informing people about this important decision because you can make a difference and save a life.